everybody to today's global R and D. Um, we have an exciting agenda for you today. We'll be talking about updates, features, and we have a couple of demos for you. Um, so without further ado, let's, let's go ahead and begin. First up, uh, Jennifer is going to talk about a new education hub. Uh, Jennifer, over to you. Thank you so much, Jason. So the Grove team has launched the ICP Education Hub. Uh, it is a page on the website uh, where you can see just a wide variety of learning resources on the internet computer. There's a, over like 200 courses, articles, and tutorials for all skill levels and topics, um, such as smart contracts, um, blockchain tech, and even more. So here's a QR code um, to get started, um, to take a look into it. So as you can see here, um, if you go on to internetcomputer.org um, and then go to develop, uh, there it shall should be a education hub um, with all these comprehensive learning resources. And so how it's kind of structured right now is you can actually uh, filter by different language, um, a token REST TypeScript, um, by level or content type, whether it's text or video, um, and also we also were able to uh, get community content um, in Spanish and Turkish as well. And there is more plans you know, to get um, to part in partnership with the ICB hubs to get courses in um, other languages as well. And recently, uh, the ANS Explain um, course um, has been uploaded. So if you have you know, any course um, that you have created in the past or know of any that um, that uh, are not on this page, we do encourage you know, anyone to submit uh, your course um, and then we'll have this listed on the page. So this, yeah, this has been really a great um, opportunity or it's gonna be a really great opportunity to kind of get more people involved um, with learning about ICP and, and uh, across all different uh, backgrounds. So thank you, uh, back to you, Jason. All right, great, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, very excited to, um, see all the new educational content going live. All right, um, next up, we are going to tell you a little bit about a incident uh, that occurred a couple weeks ago, and Manu is gonna uh, tell you a little bit about that. Manu, over to you. Yeah, thanks, Jason. Um, yeah, hey, everybody, I'm Manu, and uh, I'll speak a little bit about the and I saw that incident that happened Friday, uh, June 14. So a very brief summary of what happened is that the ANS subnet was running extremely slowly for some hours. Um, and that made it almost impossible to use things that are on, on this, on this subnet, such as ANS frontend tab or the ICP ledger. And that of course, in turn affects other depths as well. For example, the DEXs, uh, that try to talk to the ICP ledger, uh, notice this problem as well. Uh, this was only the ANS subnet, so all other subnets were running without issue. And it was more of a uh, availability issue. So the state integrity was uh, always uh, guaranteed, but it was running extremely slowly and, and it was very hard to interact with and so that. And so I'll now give a bit more context of, of how things work and what enabled this problem and, and uh, I guess the lessons we learned from it. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay, good. So. We know that subnets uh, host canisters and they process messages and subnets are powered by many replicas and they run consensus uh, via a blockchain to agree on the order of in which they should process messages. So blocks are, are created and agreed upon uh, and they contain messages that are to be processed but are not processed yet. Um, blocks also contain timestamps, which is to give the subnet a notion of time. Then the actual processing of the of the messages happens asynchronously. Um, so the idea is we agree on the input uh, order and then we deterministically process that uh, all the messages. So here in this picture, you can see that there is some blockchain already, but to create the state of subnet at height 101, uh, the inputs are the previous subnet state and the block at height 101. And that together should deterministically give you that next subnet state. Um, so this happens, uh, asynchronously and we want all of this to be fast. We want it to be low latency. And so for that, um, consensus tries to produce blocks quickly. It, it tries, it 
for most subnets, it aims like 1.3 blocks per second, approximately. Now this means deterministic processing should be able to kind of keep up, right? Otherwise we have an ever-growing backlog of blocks. So deterministic processing limits how much work it does in one round. We have these instructions uh, that we can measure also for cycles accounting. Um, and so it knows how much work it can do roughly and how much time. And it's most subnets try to limit that work to roughly what we expect to take one second under load, unless if there's no load. And if there were, the scenario would occur that somehow blocks are still produced faster than they can be processed, then consensus can observe that there is a backlog of, of blocks that are still to be processed and then dynamically uh, slow down to avoid having uh, uh, yeah, an ever-growing blockchain without it being processed. So that was a very quick recap of, of how some things work. Now we'll get into the, the three problems that, that enabled uh, the instant that we saw on, on Friday. Um, the first is that the NNS subnet runs a different configuration than other subnets. So um, canisters might want to do big compute tasks that take like a lot of computation in, in one go. And a feature was built to enable this called deterministic time slicing. So what deterministic time slicing or DTS enables is that you can do a lot of computation in a canister, but it's actually cut into different processing rounds. So that each round can be limited to one second, while the canister can do a lot more work uh, uh, because it's divided over these rounds. But now for historic reasons, DTS is not enabled on the NNS subnet. And of course, the NNS canister still needs to do some kind of reasonable work in one go. And to make that possible, the round limits are, are very high on the NNS subnet. And that means that under load, we actually expect processing route to take much longer than one second, um, which would in turn reduce the block rate because of this feedback mechanism that I mentioned earlier. Then there's the second problem, which was a performance regression. Um, a new storage layer uh, is, has been in the making uh, it's based on log structured merge trees, so we call it the LSMT storage layer. And the aim of this is that a subnet can offer better performance and allow subnets to hold more canister state in the future. So to more efficiently handle large states and a lot of state on subnets. And this was this was rolled out gradually over weeks. So you if you follow all the proposals, you saw that they finally elected multiple replica proposals for many weeks, one with the LSMT storage layer and one without such that some subnets could get it initially and then more and more could get it. And overall, the results were, were, were very good. Like on all subnets, we saw nice performance improvements, but not. But somehow when it last reached NNS subnets, there there was we, uh, a performance regression was, was observed. Um, this was actually noticed and then uh, I think the assessment was made that, you know, it was, it was not too bad that we can uh, wait for the next release where there's already some performance improvements. Um, but then during the incident, there was some, some particular load pattern that's where the regression was much worse than what was previously observed. And now together with the first problem, so the first problem allows a lot of work to be scheduled in one execution round. And the second problem made it even slower than expected. And together this led to very, very slow execution routes. This would have all been somewhat okay if it wasn't for the third problem. Um, so on the left of this slide, I tried to kind of depict one replica of a subnet, which has some blockchain and some state and users typically ask replicas, things like, Hey, here's a message I want to execute. Um, or can you please give me the status of my message? Is it, what's the result? Has it been processed yet? And so a replica would then answer based on the subnet state that they have. And actually these subnet states, they get certified that there's like a janky signature on it. Um, and so the user can get like a trustworthy answer, uh, from that subnet state. But one, one concern is that some malicious replica could actually answer based on an old subnet state that was once valid and correctly signed, but it's not up to date anymore. And for that reason, we use this time in there. So as I mentioned, there's a, this timestamp in blocks, which makes it into the subnet state. Um, and 
now a user can see based on that certified answer, it can look at the time and see if that subnet, uh, that state that, uh, is actually recent or not. So a user looks at their own view of the time and checks that the, the answer that the replica gives is based on the time, uh, less than not older than five minutes and then accepts it. And if it would be an older time, it considers it outdated and it does not accept the, the answer for the replica. The problem that happened is that because of these previous two problems, we had these super long processing rounds. So we were in a state where there were a lot of consensus blocks in the backlog um, because the processing was very slow and consensus had already slowed down a lot. So this basically each block you could think of like had a, is like one minute apart or so. And this led to a state that the, the most recent state that we had computed was actually based on a block from more than five minutes ago. And that meant that now the most recent state that replicas had was more than five minutes old. And because of this thing where users check that the state that they get is not more than five minutes old and otherwise they reject it, it led to the fact that everybody, all users um, would, would consider any answer from replicas invalid. And so even though some messages were still being processed, nobody could see that their message was being processed, which, uh, <laughs> yeah, is a, is, is a big problem, of course. So this, I think these three problems are what, what caused the, the incident to happen like it did. There's of course more learnings, uh, that, that we can take from this. So the first is that we should always err on the side of caution for the NNF subnet. So as I mentioned, we saw some regression earlier. At the time, we were not aware of this problem three. We thought it, um, it's going to be fine. Whereas Definity could have immediately proposed to uh, go back to an older version without the LSMT, uh, which would have been safer. And um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a learning uh, we should take. A second one is that this different configurations between subnets is very difficult um, and, and, and at risk. So I think we should really work hard towards minimizing configuration differences between subnets. And um, another learning is that communication is very important during each instance. Here, I think uh, Defendi didn't do a great job. We communicated very little and kind of mischaracterized the problem initially. Um, of course, it's challenging because everybody is working very hard on solving the problem, but it also left a lot of people in the dark and caused for a lot of concern, um, which is not ideal. So some concrete action items are enable determinative time slicing on the NNS subnet. I believe this is actually already in a in an electric replica version. So this will happen very soon. Um, we should explore better ways to deal with the stale state certification problem. I guess the way we have now is to not a very graceful degradation. Um, and yeah, we need to find a better process for how we communicate during impactful incidents such that, uh, yeah, everybody knows what's happening and are not <laughs> in the dark worried about, uh, what's happening. Um, that's it for me. I'm happy to answer questions. I think in the chat. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Manu. Um, it's very informational and, um, uh, gives us, I think some good insight into how these compounding problems can lead, lead to the incident. Like, uh, the one we saw. All right. Uh, next up, uh, we're going to give you a little developer experience update. Um, so. As you probably already know, developer experience is an important topic to Definity uh, R&D. And um, we look at topics that are created on the feedback board in order to understand how best to prioritize the work that we do. So each month we give you an update. Um, this month, I'm gonna give you an, a, a recap on our developer experience activities for uh, May and June. So since our last update, we had three new um, developer experience improvements that were shipped, three that were scheduled, two new topics that were created, and two topics were closed. So I'll give you uh, I'll give you the highlights in the next uh, couple of slides. So first and foremost, I'm happy to announce that the Cycles Ledger is now live. Uh, the Cycles Ledger provides a way to uh, manage cycles. Um, on behalf of canisters and accounts. It provides a more convenient uh, method for doing so than the, the previous Cycles wallet. Uh, Cycles Ledger is now 
um, fully decentralized under NNS control. It's available in DFX, and uh, we think it's going to be um, a great improvement over uh, the previous cycles wallet. Um, so please try it out. Let us let us know what you think. Next, uh, a small improvement that we made. Um, we uh, implemented the DFX kill all command. So the SDK team recently shipped a, a number of improvements to DFX that makes it less necessary to run it with the clean flag. Um, that doesn't solve everything. So for those pesky issues uh, that don't seem to go away, DFX now has a kill all command that will just kill all the processes that uh, DFX spawns. And that's available starting version 021. Um, and we have a couple more that are coming soon. So uh, enhanced orthogonal persistence um, is, we're making good progress on this. It'll be available in beta soon. Um, it's also known as transparent orthogonal persistence. And what this allows you to do is um, this will allow developers to essentially uh, uh, upgrade their canisters without deserializing and serializing uh, from main memory to stable memory. Um, it's only going to be available in Matoko, um, but we're really, we're really excited to see um, the improvements to developer experience that this feature brings. Canister state snapshots is another thing that will be coming soon, and uh, this will allow you to take a checkpoint of your um, uh, canister state and then roll it back to some previous uh, point in time if you need to do so. So we're planning to release this uh, likely in the next uh, month or so. So um, we'll give you another update next month, but in the meantime, you can go to the feedback board, uh, tune in, vote for your favorite topics, create uh, topics of your own, and uh, uh, we'll read everything and prioritize our work based on what gets voted there. All right, so next uh, we're going to jump into the roadmap update, and we're going to go back to Manu uh, for this. So Manu, over to you. Hello again. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give updates on the on the roadmap. This Sam actually prepared this, but he's at a at a conference, so I'm I'm I'm, I'm filling it. Um, as as you as you know, we've um, overhauled, we've unveiled this overhaul roadmap in May, um, with the motivation of not only releasing features in isolation, but also kind of bundling groups of them um, together, which forms like a very nice end to end story. Has examples. Um, maybe we synchronize it with some event or some conference, all with the goal of maximizing impact and, and reach uh, an as wide audience as possible. These this roadmap splits areas into uh, uh, splits things into nine core uh, areas or domains, and each of those has at least one milestone already defined. Uh, some of them even have multiple, and um, we kind of scope these or like. Well, making such that we think we can have roughly one milestone per month. That's um, uh, that's what we're aiming for. And separately, this this page also shows all the past achievements and features that have already shipped, which I think is very cool to see because you could, I, I think it, uh, yeah, it really shows how how much things are improving. And uh, there's another big backlog of other future topics that I guess are not part of a, a, a planned milestone but are still on the on the wish list uh, for, for the future. And so today, there are some small updates. Um, I'll cover which the first two milestones that we've actually reached and um, share some, some, some small adjustments to, to upcoming milestones. Um, let me see. Yes. So the first milestone that we reached was the Trillium milestone. Uh, that was on May 23rd. And this is all about um, this is, this falls into the chain fusion domain, so the 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 the, the multi-chain capabilities of the internet computer, and this specific milestone is all about um, uh, Ethereum and EVM chain integration into into the internet computer. So there were two key deliverables. The first was CKUSDC, which is like a twin token based on chain key signatures, just like CKBTC and CKETH already have. Um, but this is the first CK ERC twenty token. And uh, this brings a major stable coin into the ICP ecosystem, which I think is exciting. And uh, there's already been quite some usage uh, 
in, in this in this in this month that it's existed. Um, the second key deliverable was the EVM RPC canister. So this is a canister that makes it easy. It offers the service um, of allowing communication to other EVM chains from an IC canister in a simple way, where you just pay in cycles for the service and it reaches out to different RPC providers on your behalf and make sure they agree so you get a trustworthy answer. Um, so this one is now ready and under NS control and, and ready to use. And so what's cool to see is that this this mass also got, got quite some coverage, as you can see on the slide here. Um, yeah, so we hope to see a lot of usage of, of these features. Then the second milestone that we reached was the separatrix milestone in the identity domain. This was um, reached earlier this month. Um, this milestone is about uh, the, the core deliverable of this milestone is that Internet Identity now supports verifiable credentials. So what this now enables is that anybody with like a any computing device, like a phone, a computer, with a browser, uh, can get an II, and this now allows you to really do self-sovereign identity. So you can receive credentials, um, you can show them to relying parties. Um, this is all possible. Um, oh, I think my slide skipped. Uh, yes, here I am. Um, this was also released with like a credentials playground. So there's kind of like a demo application where you can really see how it works and that's like education purposes um, uh, and should help also people as a sample and people for people to integrate and start issuing or, or um, uh, accepting credentials. And then SDK was released to make this integration of verifiable credentials as easy as possible. Um, and some cool things already um, uh, they're already using it. I think Definity did one example at this identity conference where this was presented. Um, Definity issued a proof of attendance credential, uh, so you can you, you can have like an official badge that you were there. Um, um, there's um, uh, the side AI is working on proof of humanity credentials um, that lets you show that you're a real person and not uh, a bot, I guess. And OpenGen already accepts, uh, have the ability to verify credentials and, and have, for example, verifiable, uh, have credential gated communities. Um, yeah, so this was all just released and uh, I'm excited to what, uh, what people will build on this. Then in the chain fusion domain, there's a next milestone plan, which is called Digerium. And this is all about Bitcoin integration. So Bitcoin integration has been running on the internet computer for already a year and a half. But actually, Bitcoin evolved a lot since that time. So at the time, it was just just Bitcoin, and then since then, we saw a huge rise of the, these Bitcoin protocols and a lot of new things. And um, the goal of this milestone is to enable ICP canisters to to take advantage and, and participate in all these Bitcoin protocols. So most notably, this includes threshold Schnorr signatures. This is, um, there's already a threshold ETDSA signature, but short signatures are a different kind of digital signature and they're needed for certain types of uh, uh, of these new things on Bitcoin, for example, inscriptions and VRC20s. Um, and secondly, we want to offer on-chain access to Bitcoin block headers. So currently you have access to the UTXOs, but this doesn't suffice for, for, um, uh, for all these new things. And so that's a new thing that we want to want to enable. The small update here is that we now target August twenty four, um, and we hope to have a developer preview in July, which we can then present at the Bitcoin Nashville conference. Um, so this is coming coming soon. And then I guess um, uh, Jason already covered the topic of developer experience. So we actually have uh, we had a master plan here which we now split into two separate milestones, which you think are more cohesive stories. So the first is uh, Beryllium, which is around all things canister DevOps. So this canister snapshot feature would be part of that. Um, uh, yeah, which lets you take a copy of your state and maybe roll back if you have to. The canister logging feature is part of that, which gives you like a native logging ability, which can also log most notably when you when you're Canister actually is an error path, which you couldn't do so far. Uh, canister lifecycle hooks is a feature that that's that's planned in this milestone, which would let you do things of like exposing a function that's called whenever your cycles are low or whenever your 
memory is almost empty, uh, almost full, uh, things like that. And we want to improve the, the response codes and the error messages to make it easier uh, uh, to see what if something goes wrong with your canister. This is the first milestone. The second is about canister resource management. This one's called Thorium. And so this is really about understanding where your canister resources are being used for and, and, and uh, if you have enough uh, resources. So um, one feature in that is, is, is some way to get better cycles and instructions inside. So now it can be hard to know exactly where your cycles are going, like what's, what, what, what are your cycles being spent on. So hopefully this feature would give you uh, kind of like a breakdown or so of what your cycles uh, have been used for. Uh, the cycles ledger that Jason just mentioned kind of falls into this milestone. And um, uh, we're thinking about some form of live canister metrics that so you can see the load on your canister currently, which you could then uh, 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 follow yourself and yeah, get better insights in, into whether your canister has sufficient resources and, and things like that. So this is a small update. Um, as a reminder, you can find the roadmap uh, on internetcomputer.org slash roadmap, and you can always see the latest uh, state there. Um, and that's it for me. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Manu. Um, great to see all the progress made against the roadmap and uh, all the new capabilities each milestone is going to bring. And if you haven't um, seen that roadmap, um, I really encourage you to check it out. It shows all of our yeah, planned work um, and uh, it's, a, it's a very, very good looking uh, uh, page as well. So next we'll jump into features then. And first up, we'll talk about uh, query stats and uh, Leon is going to tell us a little bit about that. Leon, yeah, thank, you. thank you, Jason. Yeah, hi, I'm Leon from the consensus team and I'm just bringing a quick update on the query stats feature. So as a quick re uh, recap, what is the query stats feature? It's a way for canisters to get insight into queries they serve. In particular, uh, this reports the number of calls, the instruction counts and request and response bytes back to the canister. So this can be used by the canister to get insight into, into usage uh, of, of the query calls and uh, can be used for decentralized analytics. Potentially in the future, we might also use this to implement query call charging. And yeah, this is a very, very simply exposed via the canister status endpoint of the management canister. Uh, so there are just some extra fields there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, so uh, this feature has actually been active on mainnet for quite some time and it's also been available on DFX. However, we wanted to get some more insight into how it actually behaves on mainnet before we release it. But this is what we do now. It is officially released. We have documentation ready. Uh, we also have two very basic uh, sample depths, one in Rust and one in Motoko, which just showcase how to get this data out of this canister status reply. And this can be very easily copied and used for your uh, for your own depths. For an in in that uh, feature review, uh, I had a I had a demo and I had some in depth uh, explanations uh, back in end of February. So if you're interested in how this works under the hood and you haven't seen it yet, then I would refer to that uh, to that talk. Um, yeah, next slide, please. Um, yeah, here is a QR code to the documentation. Uh, and that's all I have. Thanks everybody and uh, have fun with the feature. Thank you very much, Leon. Um, and uh, yeah, please take a look at this link and uh, get uh, get going you know, with the documentation and, and, and check out the feature. Uh, next up, uh, we're gonna talk about neuron control restrictions. Uh, Pierre, would you tell us a little bit more? Sure, thank you. Yeah, so this is Bjorn from the research team. And um, yeah, as I um, just mentioned, this is about restrictions on neuron control. I mean, this used to be in place um, so that uh, um, the control of a neuron um, is restricted to um, so-called self-authenticating principles. For example, 
uh, internet identity or ledger device controlled neurons. And in particular, canisters could not directly control neurons. And the reason for that restriction was to prevent neurons from being sold or transferred to ensure that neurons vote with a long-term perspective. You can see like the above code block, which you know, essentially shows like a, a simple if statement that it forces or and used to enforce uh, these control restrictions in the NNS governance canister. Next slide, please. So uh, what of course happens often with when you have restrictions, there are ways to circumvent them. So um, for example, um, you can circumvent um, these neuron control restrictions using threshold ECDSA uh, keys. So canisters, that's a feature of the ICD platform, canisters control these keys and um, therefore also allow them to sign messages and in combination then uh, with HTTP outcodes, you can actually um, act as a controller of a neuron. Uh, similarly, if you um, actually have an internet identity controlled neuron, you can sell the internet identity and hence also the neurons which are linked to it. Yeah, so that's why um, this topic was reviewed. Next slide, please. And so um, there was an intense discussion in the forum with uh, the community. Uh, and um, I mean, it was pointed out that potentially lifting these restrictions would actually bring a lot of benefits. So for example, it would allow SNSs to control NNS neurons, um, which was actually already done by OpenShed and GoldDAO using like the um, special ECDSA um, circumvention just mentioned before. It would also facilitate um, organizational neuron ownership. There are interesting use cases in DeFi and would also bring uh, consistency with the SNS framework where actually um, SNS neurons can be transferred already or actually controlled by canister. Now, there of course, there are also concerns, um, in particular like the, what would be the impact on long-term voting and the incentives to hold these neurons if um, the um, canisters could control neurons. And yeah, hence there's quite a intense discussion in the forum. And um, on the next slide, you see the conclusion. So um, bottom line was, uh, the conclusion was to say, well, I mean, uh, it would make sense to lift that restriction, uh, but on the same time, monitor the materiality of neurons, which are under canister control and establish a threshold. Uh, and if that threshold is surpassed, additional measures would be triggered. So like, that's like the high level conclusion. You see that was also uh, baked into a motion proposal that was approved uh, in May. And now the according changes in the code base have been released um, just yesterday. Yeah, so just to so to maybe um, elaborate a little bit more. So I mean, like essentially the, the lifting restriction on the neon control means that uh, the, the if statement that I showed you on the first page is actually is gone. So um, this restriction is not in place anymore, but then the NNS governance canister implements some new metrics that um, track the total stake and voting power of uh, canister controlled neurons. And um, like there's a special set at 10% of total voting power. Uh, and in a case that sort of threshold is breached, then um, that would lead to the uh, additional implementation of uh, disincent disincentives for um, for neuron transfers. Uh, and um, for some concrete examples where I discussed in particular, there's an idea to reduce rewards for transferable neurons. Now, the, the reason why that um, measure is in a way delayed is rational is, you know, as long as it's not very material, um, it's not worth the additional effort I mean, because it would be a big effort implementation wise, but also from the user experience and hence uh, this sort of compromise was found here to um, allow it up to a certain amount. And then I think we can sort of check and monitor uh, the overall situation in, in the meantime. That's all from my side. Uh, back to you, Jason. Thank you, Beryl. Um, excited to see uh, the possibilities this new change brings. Now, next, uh, we're going to jump into a couple of demos. Um, so for the first one, 
if you've ever wondered how to make Candid uh, more flexible to the needs of your application, uh, this next demo is for you. Um, yeah, will you tell us a little bit about Candid uh, Type Selector? Yeah, sure. So, so this demo is about how do we generate bindings for Candid to uh, various host languages. And the current approach is like people start with the host language, like you start building backend for in Rust or Motoko, and then we auto generate the candidate binding for you. And then the front end takes this candidate and and um, you, you can do full development. So the the benefit of this approach is that it's very easy to get started. Uh, people doesn't need to know candidate uh, to to begin the, the development. Um, but the, the problem is that as your project gets bigger, it gets harder to maintain with this workflow. So first of all, if you look at this dependency graph, it's uh, kind of, if, if you are front-end developer, then you have to wait for the candidate to be available. That's basically the, the back-end um, developer has to uh, generate some candidate for you before you can work on the front-end code. And, and also uh, the second problem is that since this candidate file is machine generated, uh, sometimes it can have something uh, that's not very ideal for the consumers, uh, but it's it's still correct. For example, uh, if the, your backend code has generic functions like result, and then because candidate doesn't have generic types, then this result type gets uh, mapped to like a, a different numbering of, of the same type of different instantiations, like result one, result two, and result three. And, and this uh, variable naming uh, doesn't matter in terms of serialization and deserialization, but it does affect the client code. For example, the front end code will use this uh, result one and result two names in their type uh, in the type script types, and um, this affects the readability. And another problem is that sometimes uh, this numbering can also change because your backend code changes, and then this uh, becomes a breaking change for the um, for the front end code as well. And, and this is also a problem if you want to import another canister to make a in the canister course and this type names also gets propagated to you Rust code um, as, as well. And also because the, the candid um, file is auto-generated, you can't add commands to your API and, and this API is supposed to be public, like all consumers will fetch the candid interface, not your Rust code. So this is also a bit of a problem. And and then uh, another thing is that uh, for making intercanister calls, then it's hard to generate those bindings because you, uh, when you get as the input is the candy, but how do you generate a Rust binding or, or Motoko binding? And what ends up happen happening is that people write a lot of binding libraries. Like we have IC regular types, IC utils, IC XRC types, and all, all kinds of these type libraries uh, for people to use. For the developer, it's, uh, of that canister is hard to maintain. Like you have to maintain two copies, ones for the for the types and the other for for your canister. And then for the consumer, it's also uh, you have to find the right library to to import uh, into into your code. And we have some tool like uh, DC bind to help with this, but it's uh, still um, like a half baked idea. So uh, next slide. So here, uh, what we propose is um, another approach where we just reverse this uh, this arrow here. So people start with the writing the candid interface, and then and then candid becomes the source of truth of your public API. And for both the backend and the frontend, they can both generate bindings from this candid file. Uh, so the the benefit is that now the public API. Uh, becomes the first thing you write when you develop an app, and that's naturally a good thing because then the backend and frontend can agree on the common API, and they can uh, develop uh, at the same time. And also, we can give good names and documentation in the in the candidate file. Uh, also, because uh, the host binding is generated now, we don't need all these uh, uh, types library um, if you want to call some canisters. Uh, another tricky thing is that um, this is, this binding is usually one to many. Uh, from one candidate file, you can generate multiple bindings. 
uh, possible bindings for, for Rust or Motoko. So we need a second way to customize how you want to uh, map these uh, types from Candid to the host language. So this is a, also a very similar approach to Polybuff, where uh, we can write the Polybuff definitions first, and then all the host language uh, uh, data structures are generated from, from the Polybuff. And, and in terms of the, the, the problems, um, I, I'm mainly biased here, but I can only see one cons, which is that uh, now you have to learn the candidate syntax to get started first. Um, but in, in return, um, you can also not need to learn the like how do you put CDK attributes into you into your Rust code because this now is auto generated, and also if you want to write a pocket IC test, and we can also generate this automatically for you. So it's uh, it just depends on what you want to learn. Um, so I, I think both approaches has uh, their pros and cons, and maybe the original uh, current approach is good for writing small project if you want to get started quickly. But uh, as your project gets bigger and you want to make it in production, maybe the second uh, candidate-centric approach is, uh, is a more um, stable way of uh, development. So in this demo, I'm going to show how this new approach works. Okay, so, so now on the left side is my simple project. It's, as you can see, this is a, a very empty project. I started with a Rust uh, cargo.tumble file. Uh, there's no Rust code at all. And there's this uh, Tumble config uh, and the sign candidate file. So on the right side, I can show this Tumble config. It's just two lines. It shows you, I want to define a service, and here's my candidate definition. And, and this part shows the, the candidate file here. It's basically a service that takes an initialization argument, and I have two methods. So now, given these two files, I can say, um, like, it's a some uh, cargo sub command like cargo canister bygen. And now this will generate the, the canister and raster code from this candid uh, file for you. Um, so you can see the data surface are defined here, and then we define initialization argument uh, and two method endpoint automatically. Uh, it's just, uh, just one line of config. And another benefit of, of this approach is that you we can also include the, the candidate metadata into your Rust program because uh, the, the candidate code that now it's statically known. Uh, this is not, uh, so, so that, that means that you can compile this code and getting the candidate metadata already in your Watson binary. You don't need any third party tool like IC Watson to, to patch the candidate later on. So this is like um, getting after cargo build, you already have the metadata in there. Um, so so this is just shows the, the binding. So I can say write, and then I I will I will just write the the result into into my my code here. So now now comes the tricky part. Like after you get this. Uh, this binding file at the stop, like usually we don't allow users to make changes to the generated code because if you make changes and we the, the candidate interface changes, then you you change are, are lost. But here we actually find a way to allow you to make arbitrary changes and we can still figure out if you rust the code uh, conforms to the candidate implementation. So for example, here um, I can I can make arbitrary changes. I can make uh, this um, as an async function. Um, I can even add uh, commands here. So this will still implement the same candidate interface. So if I run this bindgen again, uh, it, it's checking the main file, not modifying it, but it, it checks there's no difference here. Uh, but if I change the, this to an int, then it will compare, okay, yeah, it's actually needs to use a NAT instead of uh, eight. So it only checks like uh, the things that matters to the to the type. You can you can change the, the type name here, it doesn't matter. I don't uh, really care. And you can even hide this into a module. I will 
still be able to find it. But if you are missing some implementation, like I command out this uh, this implementation, uh, then it will show that okay, you are missing this great function, and here's a signature that you can get started. Um, I can let me revert this one. I can also change the the candidate interface, and then it it shows you okay this. This uh, get profile doesn't appear in the candidate file, but you are implementing this. So basically, you after we generate the the Rust code, you can make arbitrary changes, and we will still be able to match and, and check and match to see are you still conforming to the to the candidate um, interface. So now let me let me reword my change here. Yeah. So this is for the for the stub generation. And, and another thing is if you want to import or calling another canister, then you can say an import here. Uh, for example, if I want to call the management canister, I just need to provide the the did file. And then I call binder again, you can see it's generating uh the binding to the to the management canister. That's all the all the method here. So, so this this uh, management canister is quite large. So maybe I just want to call a small subset of the method. Uh, let's say I want to call the process cycles and the uh, raw rent. Now I'm getting a much smaller function because uh, I only use uh, a two of the method, and uh, this method depends on a much fewer types. And the benefit of this restriction uh, restricting is that uh, if some other types change in the did file that you don't use, you don't care about them at all. Even if they made a breaking change, it doesn't matter to you because you don't use them. And also, um, this uh, whole template, uh, uh, th this whole code is uh, derived by uh, a handbar template. And if you are not happy with this template, you can provide your own template. And then you will, you can generate a different code. For example, here is making intercanister calls. This is a, a template for that. But if I want to make um, a IC agent client call, call, I can change it to another template. Now suddenly it's uh, taking uh, IC agent, and then uh, with the agent, I'm uh, I'm making the the calls. So it's uh, very different purposes, but uh, you can. Just change it with uh, with a template. Um, another way to import a canister. So one way is to provide a did file. Uh, another way is you can provide a, a canister ID instead. So now this uh, this generates. Um, let me let me write this file first. And then we'll move on to this. Oh, uh, okay. I want to write it first. So not not writing is just seeing the seeing the results, and and here it's basically fetching the the did file from the canister ID. Okay, this is too long. Um, let me also make a restriction to, let's say, maybe get new link for this will be much shorter. Yeah, it's basically uh, goes to the canister ID, fetch the date file for you, and then generate the binding. So you don't always need to specify the date file. If you know the canister ID, uh, we, can, we can just do that. And now let me let me write both these things into the disk. And one of the things that I say about customization is that sometimes it, the did file, because for, even for NIS now it's a automatically generated uh, candid file, and then it has these things like a result files. And maybe you don't need this want this result file to appear in your in your code, so you can. Um, you can config how you want to generate a bind gen. So I can config a bind gen section 
that says basically I want this result five to have a different name, uh, maybe like a neural result. Now you can see, um, because I'm writing that to disk already, so this is uh, diffing what you already have in the disk and what's going to generate. So you can see this uh, new result five now because a neural result and everything referenced then also gets updated. So that's uh, one change you can do. And another thing is you can also change the labels. Let's say this uh, age second, maybe I'm not happy with this name. I will change it to maybe capital A. Um, this is age. Now you can see I changed the name and I also add a certain rename attributes so that uh, the serialization can still work because the uh, the server is expecting this name. But uh, in your code, you can you are free to use whatever name uh, you have here. Uh, another thing we do is maybe for the neural info, I want to change the visibility. So I can say visibility of uh, public grids. Now it adds the grids uh, visibility to all the all the subfields, including the, the the structure itself. But maybe you want to fine tune it. You say this whole structure is public, but I want the inner ones all to be private. Uh, you can do the same thing. I can say that inside this record, this visibility is empty. Now you can see, uh, we, so we can really fine tune uh, all the all the things we we want. Uh, another thing we can do is the is the attributes, like the the attributes here. We have a default one, but uh, you are free to to change it to anything. Yeah, so that gets updated and only this type. If you want to do other types, you can you can also fine tune that as well. Um, one last property we have is that let's say this neural info uh, I I really don't like what they generate. I I write it in my own implementation. So so you can say this neural info will use a type that I define. I would say maybe my neural info. Right. So, so we have a diffing algorithm, two diffing algorithms, and when, when one doesn't work very nice, you can try another one. This is different by, by the line, so you can see the diff more clearly. Uh, because I use this uh, use type of neural info, so then this binding is now gone because I'm using new binding, so I don't need this definition anymore. And uh, whenever I reference neural info, it becomes my neural info. So this gets changes. But one tricky thing about this use type is that um, I only know this as a, as a string. I don't know what that means. So maybe you said you implement this, but maybe it's it's uh, not correct implementation of that candy type. But I I can never know. So to make sure that I really generate the correct thing for each occurrence of use type, I will generate a test here. It basically um, emits the, the candidate type, like this neural info, and I'm going to check if this my neural info conforms to uh, this candidate type. So, um, and if later this candidate type changes, this test will also change. And then if you didn't change the, the my neural info type, then the test will fail. So it will always catch if there's something uh, that's not used. Uh, another thing to notice is that now we get some a bunch of errors because of this use type. Uh, it, it tells us that a bunch of uh, attributes we said earlier is not used. And that's because uh, we delete this whole generation. So any tuning involved in uh, changing these attributes are now not used. So this is a useful thing to, to let the user know because uh, it, sometimes it's hard to, to debug things, and we can, we want to tell you uh, whether your attributes are getting used or not. And, and also, like sometimes, uh, if you 
if you think this test is is not needed, then you can say no test. So I will not generate a test. Yeah. Um, right. So that, that's uh, basically the the workflow that I'm I'm proposing. It basically you you can start with a service section and then uh, also gradually add imports here and you. And for every section, you can do this the uh, cu cu customization as, as you need it. So, uh, I'm happy to take any questions. There. Wow, thank you, Ian. Uh, very impressive demo. I, it feels a lot like magic, um, and I, I think it's going to be a game changer for cancer development. Um, well, great. So uh, next up, we have one more uh, demo uh, by Decide AI. Um, Jesse, would you like to, uh, tell us a little bit more? I'm Jesse. Thanks for having me. I'm lead AI, uh, researcher at Decide AI, and uh, I'm happy to hear, to be here to discuss some of our early research on running AI applications on the internet computer and demo what's on chain today. Uh, we believe that the future will need an AI marketplace of per permanent APIs that transparently handle user data while maintaining privacy. Guarantee tamper-proof results. You know what you're getting is what you ask for, and utilize web-native payments to provide DApps and their users complete freedom and flexibility in what AI to use. In the decentralized community, censorship is typically associated with government or corporate censorship of individuals. The app that we're going to show, Redactor, is for user control over censorship. Content moderation may not be the most important thing ever, but it is a necessary part of, of forum or social uh, applications. So by using AI, dApps can improve immediate and automated detection of abusive text, and then a user can deal with the text however they want. I personally have gotten viral messages from people in a Facebook group that I previously moderated because I blocked irrelevant posts, even if just to give the user or moderator a moment to prepare for the con con content, it's worth worthwhile for me. Um, so we can discuss the app architecture briefly before we demo it. The front end is on your local computer. It sends the text to a tokenization canister, which returns the inputs for the AI model. Those inputs are then sent to the AI canister, which returns an abusiveness score for every token. On the front end, the abusiveness score is used to blur individual tokens, and those token scores are also summed up in order to provide a total abusiveness score for the text which was input. The current design achieves an 80% R-square on the measuring hate speech data set and can process 64 tokens per request and takes approximately 0 0.2 seconds. Sorry. So right, hopefully you can see the, the web app now. This is the on-chain. Um, demoing this application has proven tricky to me in the past because I don't enjoy reading, writing, or saying the expressions or words that the application does does well at detecting as abuse. Um, so yesterday I mentioned this to a, to a friend and they admitted to me in confidence that they once said to someone, I wish I had a fork, I'd stick it in your eye, um, which doesn't have any so harsh words, but is clearly violent. And the violent part of the text is detected and blurred. Um, obviously, this is just a setting that the user could uh, la allow or not allow, and and the total score shows that it's abuse. We could we could tweak it to say, uh, I'd be able to eat this yummy salad, and it's no longer abusive and no longer blurred out. Um, we we can similarly simulate. Um, what someone might say when reviewing this application, they didn't like it, say censorship on chain, that's against everything blockchain stands for. So definitely not an abusive uh, statement. And then we could, we could reply. This application is meant to herald the new era of putting consumers in control of AI, again, not abusive. And then you could tag something abusive on the end that's unnecessary. And we can see 
it's now slightly abusive and the abusive part is blurred out. Um, so, so what's the model architecture? So we talked about the canister architecture. Um, talk about the model architecture. So we leveraged uh, the semantic and positional embeddings from GPT-2. These embeddings are followed by a series of convnets and activation functions. The last step was introduced in order to allow us to produce a score per token, um, but train a data set that only provides a single abusive score for the entire sentence. Um, so some people would probably ask, why no transformers or recurrent neural nets? Uh, and this comes down to efficiency. We're currently integrating quantized models and same instruction multiple data computation as uh, DFX uh, enabled. Um, once that that's done, we can upgrade the CNNs into local attention mechanisms. And of course, we'll provide this as open source examples for the community. Um, and earlier this year, to speak to the efficiency on, on older DFX versions, um, we, we conducted two experiments relevant to this application. Uh, first was assessing how many tokens we could process with the GP, with GPT-2 on the internet computer. Um, so GPT-2's architecture is it has an embedding layer followed by 12 decoder blocks. Um, we turned each into its own call function. Um, then we could experiment with setting those call functions as e either an update or a query call. When we only call the embedding, uh, we're right. able to process more tokens than GPT-2 can handle. Uh, and so we're capped at GPT-2's capacity of uh, 1,024. Um, we can see that calculating the embeddings is extremely efficient and can be easily done uh, as a query. However, we're unable to run the entire model as a single query. Um, what we can do uh, is have a main function called as an update call and each decoder block called as a query. Um, this approach enables us to process 12 tokens, which is the maximum capacity of each decoder block when run as a query. If we were to call each decoder block with an update call, we can process up to 52 tokens, but it takes a bit of time to get through all tokens, to get through all 12 layers. Sorry. The next experiment was intended to roughly assess the accuracy speed trade-off of several model architectures. If we just took the embeddings and apply a linear function on top, we could process the data quickly, but not do so well. Uh, it turns out that if we add just another layer at very little cost in computation, we still keep full capacity and speed and improve performance. If we want to add a single decoder block, we can improve accuracy further and still keep the, the call as a fast query call, but at the cost of token capacity. If we, if we stack even more decoders, we can improve accuracy more, but at the cost of running slower. Uh, if you remember, the ComNet design we used in Redactor could process 64 tokens as a single query and was showing a high R-square value. Uh, the roadmap, which we spoke to a bit earlier, centers around integrating the candle crate, leveraging SIMD and quantized models. Uh, then the application can, can be improved in both architecture and capabilities. Uh, and then we'll integrate examining text as a conversation rather than independent lines of text and integrating images um, following, followed by research on training on chain. So I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I'm also willing to try some questions if that is of interest. Thank you, Jesse. Um, great to see uh, more and more sophisticated applications running on internet computers, especially those uh, um, in the space of, of AI. Um, so very cool. And thank you for that. Uh, thank you for that demo. All right, everybody, that's a wrap for this week. Um, thank you for attending. We'll see you all next week. Uh, have a nice rest of your day.